Hey everyone, welcome to the first online series of an introduction to computational design tutorials. As promised, we're giving everyone the opportunity to be exposed to a new set of tools and in particular using Rhino and Grasshopper. This tutorial series is going to be broken down into four or five parts, about 10 to 15 minutes each. That way you're not expected to sit down and sit through an entire hour or hour and a half lecture and it will also make it easier to come back and re-watch certain parts that you might be interested in. So I guess first and foremost we're not expecting everyone to pick this up straight away or at least we're not expecting everyone to use the software for their assignment but it is a really good opportunity to introduce you to at least what it's capable of, how it's used in practice. I'll show you some case studies or precedents or examples that are out there that architects have um, used this software to deliver certain projects. Now before we go any further I just want to talk about some of the terminology. You can see up on the screen I have computational design but you'll find that these terms are quite interchangeable so you might have heard of computational design or parametric design, algorithmic design, generative design, scripting, coding, so they all more or less mean the same thing, especially within the context of Grasshopper or Dynamo. Some might have slight variances to it, so for example generative design might mean something slightly different where we're talking about generating hundreds or thousands of outputs through an evolutionary solver. Parametric design is quite a broad, more of an umbrella term that you could relate to in Revit for instance. In Revit you set parameters up, you set the height of a wall, you draw that wall, and you link it to a level, if you change that level the wall height will update. So Grasshopper is more in the computational design, algorithmic design space, although they are used interchangeably. So I, I hope by now you've all seen the Dropbox links and the announcement that I posted yesterday. This one hour recording will be available to you online that you can rewatch whenever you like and then next week we'll go through and do a live session where I might work through another exercise and then we'll do a Q&A and I'll try to help people who are having trouble. So going to the course link, Grasshopper tutorial list, there are two tutorials there that I'd like you to watch before coming back and watching this. So if you haven't watched either of these please pause, download this PDF and come back and watch this once you've seen them. So to view the links you've got to download the PDF and it's an interactive PDF so you can just click on any of the headings. I suggest starting with the Mode Lab introduction as it's uh, very basic and will give you a good introduction into the thinking and background of this way of working and it will go through a pretty basic understanding of the interface and the toolbars. So I'm not going to go into that in my lecture, I'm going to assume you've watched this. After that I suggest going to watch the David Rutten introduction. He's the de developer of Grasshopper, so he's the guy who's invented Grasshopper and I just think it would be really worthwhile watching that series as well. Okay, in terms of resources and assistance. Obviously I'll be around so if you have any queries or questions feel free to email me, we can do video conferences, you can send me your scripts, I'm here to help. But I also would like to have seen you attempt to solve some of the problems yourself. So there are tutorial online, the forum, the Grasshopper 3D forum is a great resource which is this one here. Under the learn tab you'll find a number of different resources available to you. So this is the David Rutten example. The MODELAB Primer, which is a bit of a bible for understanding Grasshopper. So it's worth downloading that and having that on PDF. Otherwise there's an endless number of resources available to you. So feel free to get stuck into those. Another great thing about the forum is that you can ask questions the community are pretty good at getting back to you with any questions. Obviously put some time into writing out the explanation so people can understand what it is you're asking. 
but also if you're looking for something in particular, let's say a um, facade division, you can type that into the search bar and it will bring up all the old forums. So more, more often than not, you'll probably be able to find code that's available to you that you can download and um, use as a starting point. So I've just picked a random one here. Someone's posted a query wanting to recreate this facade. Um, and then you see a lot of people respond with solutions and often code, so you can download that and reuse that. And I do encourage you to start that way. It's a great way to be able to get outputs without needing to fully understand the software. Um, I just want to point you to the new Grasshopper forum. So the one I showed you previously is an old one. So all the stuff's still available to you to search, but any new questions should go onto this forum. So Grasshopper Discourse. I've migrated it onto the McNeil forum. And again, if you've searched something on the old one, you can't find an answer, you can also try this one here. So sun responsive facade person asking the question puts up their code so you, to get a response it's often worth having given it a crack yourself so people will take you seriously and then you'll see that they'll post responses back onto the forum for you so you can download the code. Okay so moving past tutorials there's also some resources where you can download pre-existing code so if you go look at these repositories, for example, I'll click on the Formula Arts link. And in here, you'll see that uh, Michael Pryor, who is also the developer of Pufferfish, has a series of code available to us that you can download and experiment with. OK, now let's look at some presets. This firm in particular have been one of the early adopters of computation design within the practice. And the reason I'm showing you this example is because it's a really good, this image in particular is a really good way of how you can diagram out your design process. By diagramming out your thoughts in a series of vignettes will help you understand how you might code that particular design solution. So in this example, you have a circle with a center point and a series of lines. The second stage is dividing that circle up into X number of points and then every other point is moved up in the Z axis and then so on and so forth. Another example is the Barclays Center by Shop Architects. This building was entirely developed within Grasshopper as a computation design model and in particular the facade was driven by the digital model and sent through to fabrication. Shop Architects actually took it a step further and developed up an app where they could work with their fabricators and the installation crew to identify every panel that was fabricated, delivered and installed on site. And so this is the unrolled elevation of that facade. Another example is the Samaya Museum in Mexico, which is a favourite project of mine. This project is quite was quite a challenge and I'll just move on to this PDF which is um, quite an amazing document about the facade design process. So here you can see that the entire process is more or less digital, starting from surface with design intent, surface generation, concept design, through to a surface analysis and then a pattern panelization and then from there you've got to start to look at how you can make this thing. In the real world it's unrealistic to have thousands of unique pieces. Not only is it expensive, hard to manufacture, it's also really hard to install. So the next step was to rationalize the geometry and as ever called it here to cluster it into a number of options. And the beauty of working within Grasshopper, if this design intent or the base form changes, the geometry changes, the clustering, the panelization, 
all the structural detailing will change and update with the model. This data is then taken through to CAD CAM for fabrication. The final product is basically driven as a linear process from the design intent through to fabrication and then installation. And you can see here some of the geometrical analysis that was undertaken for the form and then some of the panelization and rationalization processes. The use of computational design isn't always necessarily associated with organic forms. So this is an example by a firm in LA called Yazdani Studio. And this is for a campus building. Pretty regular, traditional looking building, although the planning process of it was heavily driven by computation. So I'll just quickly show you a short video um, that is in response to that project. We completed a project at the University of Utah for the Sun Studios. And we were asked to create a home for innovation at a 20,000 square feet of makerspace in a 400 bed dormitory. Now, to put that in perspective, these are two completely different programs that have never been brought together before. So, on one end of the spectrum, you have a place where it's full of collaboration and learning and people trying to launch startups. And then you have a, f a dormitory where you need to sleep study and relax. So how do we tackle this problem? And how do we make something more than the sum of its parts? I mean, I think this is what the iPhone looked like before Steve Jobs got a hold of it, but it's, uh, it's kind of a good example of how you can look at all the components from both devices and then bring them together in a way that is better than what they were when they were apart. So we took a computational approach to this. Um, we used physics engines like kangaroo in Grasshopper, and that, I know you think it wasn't my idea to use the kangaroo, but um, we also used Gephi and uh, other data visualization tools to map the relationships of program, looking specifically for overlaps in common activities. And we went through a kind of data collection phase um, from online research and user surveys, but these kind of things are really hard to be completely objective about. Um, and at some point, someone in the studio had to sit there and actually assign a value to each piece of program. Um, we didn't have to do all 56,700 combinations because we had cross-referencing to do that. I think it was about 50 or 70 um, that we actually had to do ourselves. But it is guided by intuition. And so we ended up with these kind of uh, beautiful diagrams. Um, but the power of these diagrams wasn't just in the physics engines that solved them. It was in this playground of information that we got. And it led to interpretation, inspiration, and brought intuition back into the process. So I mentioned we're looking at overlaps. And where can we create these overlaps between the whole building, all the floors, between all the suites on a floor, and between all the dorms in a suite. And this gave birth to the garage, the maker space, and what we call the modular suite. Okay, so you can see there an example of how computational design and coding within Grasshopper was used to solve a complex programmatic problem with the final design still being quite traditional in its appearance. So I'll post up the link to this so you can watch the rest of it. There's some good stuff in that and I recommend you do go back and have a look. And another example of computational design used on a master planning feasibility level. And I'll just show you a brief snippet. This is a tool that allows you to plug in your program, see your on-screen display about available spaces, relationships between programs, view analysis within the space, but also from um, the space looking out. This practice HDR have a special team devoted to this type of research called D3. And again, similar to NBBJ, they have been integral part of the development of computational design in practice. Okay, I'll leave it there and I'll see you in the next video.